The beginning of chapter 15 of Genesis says, and after these things, which means this is a continuation of the events from the battle and the slaughter and the visitation of Melchizedek and the keeping of his oath. One can imagine what Abram was going through that night. He was a great leader. Many people had many agreements of servitude with him. In that time, if a man was alone, or there was a community of a small number, they were in constant danger. Either wild animals, warlords, slave traders, there was always a threat. If a person joins a larger group, he has more protection and more food. He is part of a more powerful group and has a better chance at survival. Abram had many servants of this nature. They became hired for life. Their children became Abram's army, and Abram calls the shots. He is the ultimate leader and owner of everyone in his caravan. He feeds them and protects them as a group. When he gave away all the booty, he gave a tenth to Melchizedek, and the rest he just walked away from. The word of Jehovah came to Abram in a vision that night, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, to a Christian, when you say the word of the Lord, you are talking about Jesus. Because many times the Bible calls Jesus the word. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, 14, is the most famous of these times. John, chapter 1, verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth." End quote. God tells Abram, you got the best deal of all, you got me. But Abram says he has no heir, no son. His wife is barren and his servant is set to inherit everything. But the word of the Lord answers him and says that he shall have an heir. And from his own bowels, the Lord then brought him outside and said, Look at the stars and try to number them. So shall your seed be. So many you cannot number them. And Abram believed Jehovah, and Jehovah counted it to him as righteousness. Okay, first let's look at the blessings list for Abram so far. Adding to all the things we've added so far, we also add, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You shall have an heir from your own bowels. Thy seed shall be as numerous as the stars. And Abram is counted as righteous. Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This is spoken of a few times by the Apostle Paul, who was the Christian apostle to the Gentiles. Here Paul refers to this incident in the epistle to the Romans. Romans chapter 4, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. End quote. In Paul's epistle to the Galatians, the Galatians were Gentile converts who converted to Christ. But after that, there were Jewish teachers coming to them, telling them that they must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be righteous before God. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul is teaching them not to be circumcised. We'll read some of this also touches on this subject. In Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes even Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only I would learn from you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you are now made perfect by the flesh? 
Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He, therefore, that ministers to you by the Spirit, and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, know you, therefore, that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham? And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. End quote. This is how the Apostle Paul explains how Christian believers become grafted in as children of God through faith. In other words, those who believe in Jesus have the same faith as Abram had when he believed God. After this moment, when Abram was blessed by Jehovah, with all of these blessings, he says to Abram, I am Jehovah who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. He is telling Abram, I brought you here from your birth for this purpose. Even when your father moved to Haran, it was me bringing you here. Abram's response to God, he says, Lord Jehovah, how will I know that I shall inherit it? After all these promises and blessings from God, and Abram believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, Abram has doubt. He says, how will I know? Believing is knowing without seeing, but Abram's belief is not strong yet. He needs physical evidence before he can believe. God tells him to take a cow, a she-goat, and a turtle dove and cut them in half. This is Abram's belief system, that by doing this he will know the promises are real. Abram spent the day keeping the birds away from the carcasses, and when the sun went down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness came over him, and a great smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces of meat. And he said to Abram, Know for sure that your children will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They will be slaves and serve them for four hundred years. And that nation whom they will serve I will judge and after that they will come out of there with great riches. And you shall die in peace and be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they will come back here again, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. End quote. In that day God made a covenant with Abram, saying, I have given this land to your children from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River. Now this is a lot different than before. Before, Abram was to inherit all the land, but now it will be given in four generations because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Abram's children did go into slavery in Egypt for 400 years, and they were brought out mightily through Moses, and they did inherit the land which we will see as we go through the history. But what lesson is there here for us about faith and lack of faith? On the one hand, Abram believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness. On the other hand, he doubted and did a lot of work and went through a nightmare which put his children into slavery so that he would know. Let's look at what the Christian apostles have to say about this. Here in the next quote, Continuing where we left off in Galatians, when Paul says law, he is speaking of the law of Moses, which was brought in after the exodus from Egypt, but was foretold here to Abram in the dream concerning judgment. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, 
being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. It said not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God and Christ, the law which was four hundred and thirty years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abram by a promise. Wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. End quote. Abram had faith and he was counted as righteous. But then he lost his faith and said, How will I know? That is when the law was brought in to teach him how to have faith. Abram stepped into unbelief, and the result was darkness and judgment to his children. Yet while he had simple faith, he was counted righteousness. This principle of faith is also demonstrated by Jesus walking on water and teaching Peter to walk on water. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, we read, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, Bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they were come unto the ship and the wind ceased, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, you are the Son of God. End quote. Now, after the dream of the burning furnace, God promises to give Abram's children the land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Some people interpret that to be from the Nile River to the Euphrates River. The key here is where it is the river of Egypt. It is a river, but not as great as the Euphrates. The Nile River is as great as the Euphrates, isn't it? Some commentators understand the river of Egypt as the Wadi al-Arish, which is in the Sinai Desert. A Wadi is a desert river, which is dry in the summer, but turns into a torrent in the rainy season, and then becomes a river, but eventually dries up in the summer again. This Wadi al-Arish is the traditional border of Egypt. These borders, from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River, are related to the dream of the furnace and the 400 years. This is the land that will be theirs after the 400 years of Egypt. At the end of chapter 15, God lists out the occupants of the land of Canaan. The land of the Canaanites, Kenizzites, and the Kadamites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, and Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. We can see these names, which appear in blue, 
are already different family names than given at the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 that we studied in episode 7. Some of them are the same names. Some of the Canaanite tribes are named here along with the Rephaim. This is another name for Nephilim, the ancient race of giants, which is explained in episodes 2 and 3. The Nephilim have somehow managed to mingle themselves with the Canaanite tribes. Could this be related to the curse of Canaan? Chapter 16 of Genesis begins a new story about Abram. I suppose that after the dream, Abram was still down about having no heir. His wife Sarai was barren, meaning not making children, and he had no heir. Even after all the promises and the dream, his wife also felt bad about it. She wanted very much to give Abram an heir. She then had a great idea. She had a maid, an Egyptian woman named Hagar. If Abram made a child with her, it would be his child by Sarai, his wife, because she owns Hagar. Abram thought that was a brilliant idea. So he made a child with Hagar, and when the maid was pregnant, carrying the heir of Abram, while the wife did not, the maid thought she was better than the wife. When Sarai went to Abram about the problem, Abram told her to deal with it herself, and Hagar, after being dealt harshly with, left the camp. And the angel of Jehovah found Hagar by a fountain of water in the wilderness. The angel reminds her of her place in life and says to her, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where did you come from and where are you going? She answered, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of Jehovah then says to her, Return and submit yourself to Sarai. I will multiply your seed so greatly that it will not be numbered. You shall name your child Ishmael, which means God hears, because Jehovah has heard your troubles. And Ishmael shall be a wild man. He will be against everyone, and everyone will be against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brothers. And Hagar cried out the name of Jehovah and said, You are the God who sees me. And she said to herself, Have I seen him that sees me? This is why that fountain is named Bir La Harai, which means well of seeing, which is in the Sinai desert. And Hagar bare Abram a son when he was 86 years old, and he named him Ishmael. Muhammad, the prophet and founder of Islam, lived in Arabia at about 600 AD. Islamic literature claims that Abram and Ishmael built the Kaaba in Mecca, which is the large black square structure in Mecca, which is the holiest site in Islam. Muhammad also traced his ancestry to Ishmael, the firstborn son of Abraham. Chapter 17 of Genesis begins a new narrative, this time about the institution of circumcision. This event takes place 13 years later, when Abram was 99 years old. Jehovah appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be perfect. This is an important thing to understand. Abram did not know Jehovah as Jehovah. Here, Jehovah introduces himself as Almighty God, or El Shaddai in the Hebrew language. It basically means the highest God, the God of everything. What, you don't believe me that Abram did not know Jehovah's name? Here is what Jehovah said to Moses 1100 years later in Exodus chapter 6 verse 2. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah I was not known to them. End quote. Jehovah introduces himself to Abram as El Shaddai, God Almighty. And he says to him, I will make my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. You shall be a father of many nations. Your name shall no longer be Abram, 
From now on it shall be Abraham. Abram means father. Abraham means father of nations. Nations and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between you and me and your children after you in each generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your children after you. I will give to you and to your children all of the land of Canaan forever, and I will be their God. You must keep my covenant, you and your children after you. This is how you keep the covenant. Every male child among you must be circumcised. From your own family to your servants, they all must be circumcised. Whoever is not circumcised shall be cut off from his people. And as for your wife Sarai, her name is no longer Sarai. It is now Sarah. Sarai means dominating. Sarah means queen. I will bless her and I will give you a son from her. She will be a mother of nations. Kings of nations shall come out of her. Abraham laughed within his heart and thought, How can Sarah have my son when I am a hundred years old? He did not believe God, and he pleaded for Ishmael, his thirteen-year-old son, his firstborn, to be his heir. God answered him and said, As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Remember, Ishmael means God hears. I have blessed him, and he will be fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be established with Isaac, who will be born to Sarah at this time next year. Isaac means laughter. And after this, on the same day, Abraham had every male in his household, slave and free, circumcised, including himself and Ishmael. Now let's take a look at the list of blessings again. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Unto thy seed I will give this land, and that was at Shechem. I will make your seed as numerous as the dust of the earth. I will give you the land in every direction as far as you can see. And then after he was blessed by Melchizedek, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You shall have an heir from your own bowels. Thy seed shall be as numerous as the stars, and you are counted as righteous for believing. And then after Abram asked, how will I know I will receive these things? Then there was the smoking furnace, the 400 years of slavery. They will come out from slavery with great riches. This is uh, like being purified through suffering. They will be given the land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River. <clears throat> and now the appearance of El Shaddai, God Almighty, and he receives more blessing. I will multiply you exceedingly. You will be a father of nations. You will have a son named Isaac. Ishmael will also be a great nation with 12 princes. The rite of circumcision is given and an everlasting covenant to all generations to possess the land of Canaan forever. Now there seems to be conflicting promises. Before, it was the land in every direction as far as you can see, wherever you set your foot. Now, it is just the land of Canaan. And remember, the first time borders are mentioned in the Bible is in the Table of Nations, chapter 10. Now here, at the end of chapter 15, there are borders again mentioned the borders of Israel. And Israel inherits all of the land of Canaan. This is the first two times in the Bible borders are ever mentioned. Now before, it was all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But now, after the circumcision is given, 
Now it is those who are not circumcised shall be cut off from his people. Now let's look at what the Apostle Paul teaches about this. You will find me referring to Paul repeatedly because he is the Apostle to the Gentiles. Paul explains everything in detail. Jesus came to accomplish a task. In dying and being resurrected on the third day, Jesus made a change. He spoke in parables so that the forces of darkness did not know what he was doing. But after he was resurrected, he sent the Holy Spirit into believers who is the great teacher. Paul was a very great teacher with the Holy Spirit. Because of the work of Jesus, Paul was able now to speak freely and clearly. Or should I say that God is now able to speak plainly because of the task he accomplished through Jesus Christ, who sent the Holy Spirit into the world to speak plainly through Paul and the other apostles. Let's hear what Paul says about Ishmael and Isaac. Remember, the Galatians were the Gentiles who were being told by the Jews, you have to get circumcised if you want to be saved. So in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21, Paul says, Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bears not. Break forth and cry, thou that travails not. For the desolate has many more children than she which has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are the children of promise. End quote. We see here and in other places that there are actually two covenants. One of the freedom where Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and one where Abraham doubted God and he was brought into bondage. Let's look at the circumcision. What is that about? Circumcision is an act of cutting off the foreskin of the penis and throwing it away as a symbol that what Abram did with Hagar was not according to God's promise that he would have an heir. The heir would be the firstborn son from the circumcised Abram and not the uncircumcised Abram, as Ishmael was. Now we will read from Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not a entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be not otherwise minded, but he that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, 
but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under law. End quote. This topic can go quite deep, and I don't want to get too deep into it yet, but basically speaking, for every principle, there is a spiritual and physical aspect to it. The one covenant, which pertains to Moses and the keeping of the law and the circumcision and rituals and keeping specific days, all pertain to the physical world, which is in bondage to a system of righteousness by works. But there is an alternate covenant in Christ which is spiritual and pertains to believing. Each principle in the physical covenant has a spiritual counterpart in the spiritual covenant. Here is one more scripture from Paul to help understand this contrast between the physical and spiritual covenant. Romans chapter 4 starting verse 9 Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all of them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that their righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which were of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. Because the law works wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to that which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. End quote. You see, it all comes back to faith. When Abram believed in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, it was only after he doubted that he became a transgressor, and the law came. But along with it also came the promise of a coming son. This also ties in with the priesthood of Melchizedek, because in the law of Moses, God set up the Levitical priesthood of the temple, who cleansed the sins of the people on a daily basis, and once a year all the people's sins are dispensed with as the high priest enters the most holy part of the temple and offers sacrifice. But in the Christian epistle to the Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, offering himself for the sins of mankind once for all time. The covenant of righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ is on the uncircumcised or the circumcised, because it is to all who believe, whether they are circumcised or not. 